wonder are the waters lord when i feel the waves around me calm the sea when i cry for help please hear me lord and hold out your hand touch my life still That's a pretty big book. Just open it up somewhere. <laughs> Chapter 24. The setting of this passage, Jesus has gone to the cross. He has died, and three days have passed, and He has risen. And we come to verse 36. The Lord is appearing to the disciples and he's going to speak to them. And he says, And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are you troubled? 
And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is by myself. Handle me and see, for spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wandered, he said unto them, Have ye any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of an honeycomb. And he took it and did eat before them. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Folks, don't miss that. Don't miss that little tidbit right there. While I was wet yet with you, all these things, he spake these things, all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Uh, folks, I love the Bible. You know, we have books today that we read. And, 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 and uh, I've been packing up my office and, and going through books, books and books and books. And what are they about? You know, we got, I've got books about missionaries and, and uh, I've got books on Robert Murray McShane and, and I love to read. Boy, what a, what a preacher. What a man with a heart for God. I've got books on D.L. Moody and Charles Spurgeon and, and, and on Adoniram Judson. Oh, what a man of God Adoniram Judson was. And, and you read about them and their exploits and what God did through these men. But these are books about those men. Folks, when we pick this book up right here, it's a book about Jesus Christ. What a book. A book that'll guide our life. A book that when we read it, there. I've got books in my in my office, and 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 honestly, folks, I, I look at them sometimes, and, and I read them, and and and. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend them to somebody else to read. I might be looking for some information about one thing or another. Uh, but I, I, there are things in some of those books I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend you read them. <laughs> uh, and I'm not talking about worldly books. I'm talking about theological books because there's so much stuff out there today. Um, when I was in school and we had to buy a book for college, the college always had a stamp and, and said that, I can't remember exactly what it said, but in every, every book that they sold, there was a stamp in there that said something like, uh, we don't endorse everything written in this book. Oh, but listen, when I pick this book up, I endorse it from Genesis to Revelation. One guy said, I believe it from Genesis to the maps in the back. I even believe the maps in the back. Well, I don't know if I'd go that far as believe all the maps. But every word in this book, I believe it. I believe it. Yay. <laughs> Uh, while I was wet, yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. It's all about me. And I've been telling you, have I been so long with you? <laughs> and verse 45, then he opened, he, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Oh God, Help us understand the scriptures. Greatest need we have is to understand this book. <laughs> and he's given us a way to do that. Now, hang on. 
that they might understand the Scriptures. Verse 46, He said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Look at it. And here's the mandate. Here's the job that He's given them to do. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. All right. Um, <laughs> here's the job. In verse 48, and you're witnesses of these things, but you're not ready to go do it yet. You're not equipped for the job yet. Look at verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. I preached to a message this morning again. We've been preaching a series of messages on the Holy Spirit. And I want to follow that theme again this morning. And I want to preach to you the, the title of the message would be something like this. The difference that the Holy Spirit makes. Let's pray. Father, oh God, I'm overwhelmed with the subject at hand this morning. And Lord, you know in of myself I'm incapable of imparting this truth. But I pray, Father, that the promise that you gave would come is here. And that he would take truth and apply it to our hearts today. And it make a difference in our life in the way that we live for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus gave the disciples a world-changing job to do. That repentance and remissions of sin should be preached in his name among all nations. What a job. What a job. They were to preach the gospel to every creature on the planet. Uh, yet after giving them this task to preach, this wonderful news that he told them to go out and to do, uh, uh, he said, you're not ready to go yet. In other words, he said, don't go yet. You're, you, you're not ready. You're not equipped for this job that I've given you to do. And this morning I want to look at the reason, some of the reasons uh, for the delay in carrying out His command. Uh, but take this away that you and I must allow the Holy Spirit to make a difference in our life. And folks, He will. The Spirit of God will make a difference if we'll yield to Him. But that, that'll be the key. Will you yield to Him or not? We can choose not to yield to Him. And we'll miss His best for our life. But a couple of things that I want to, as we get into this and we think about the disciples, they're, they're standing there, they're, they've met the risen Lord now. And he's, 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 but they're, they're like, what in the world? Can you imagine? They watched him die. They watched him put in a, in a sealed tomb and, and, and they're afraid. And then he shows up before them and, and man, they think they've seen a ghost. And then he sits down to have a fish meal with him. I, I tell you what, but I, I like it more and more. All the time. They eat fish together. It, this is this is getting good. And um, and then he says, but now I want you to go forth. You're going to preach the gospel all over this world. But don't go yet. You think about these disciples right here. And one of the things I want you to, to notice about them, they're not ready to go yet, but, but they're disciples of the Lord. They, uh, Pentecost has not come yet. He said, you, you tarry in Jerusalem till you be endued with power. We talked about that last week. Uh, be endued with power. That's the ability to go out and do the job that God's called us to do. You're not ready yet. But they are they're believers. They're disciples of the Lord. Um, turn with me to the Gospel of John. 
uh, this morning for just a few minutes. John chapter 17. Tim, I'm, I'm stepping all over your, your book you're teaching this, but I'm getting a little bit of, yeah, I'm way ahead of you now, so by the time you get here, they won't remember what I said, so. <laughs> They're disciples of the Lord. Uh, they've been converted. Uh, uh, Pentecost has not come yet, uh, but make no mista mistake about it. Look in John chapter 17. Look at verse 2. The Bible says, As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Uh, look down at verse 6, uh, if you would. And I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine, were, uh, th thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Look down at verse 9. Now I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Look at verse 11. And now I'm no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name, those that thou gavest me. I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Look down at verse 24. So you get the idea. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. These were these were these were people that that believed in Jesus. They'd been with him throughout the three years that he had been uh, in his ministry. They'd seen him die on a cross. Uh, they'd seen him after he had rose from the dead. So they knew him while he was living. They saw when he died, and now they've seen him rise again. Uh, but you're not ready to go yet. Tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. God was bringing about a change in dispensations. Now, folks, I'm a dispensationalist, and basically what that means is God, in, in different periods of time, he, he dealt with people in different ways, and, 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 and there's sort of a progressive uh, revelation that, that, he, that he's doing. And uh, in, in the age of creation, uh, that was a dispensation. Uh, there was an age of conscience when, uh, when man... Uh, fell and uh, and fell into sin and uh, there was the, the the age of of law the dispensation of the law uh, and, and God was dealing uh, with people in a certain way and and then after the law there was the church age the dispensation of the church and 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 so the, the the dispensation of law was passing away listen folks aren't you glad we don't live under the dispensation of the law just go read Leviticus and when you get through say thank you Jesus that I don't live under that now nothing wrong with the law law is perfect law was given, us, given to show us that we couldn't measure up and then in the church age it shows us that Jesus come to die for our sins to deliver us to, to keep for us what we couldn't keep. You see, in Jesus Christ, I'm complete in Him. Jesus is the perfect fulfillment of the law, and I'm in Jesus Christ. So nothing wrong with the law, but, but you and I can't keep it, folks. It'd be impossible to do. There was a, a change coming, and, and, and so the law's not bad. It shows us where we fall short, but we come into the church and... And, and some people call it the, the dispensation of grace. And I like the dispensation of the church because I believe we've always lived under grace. Noah found grace in the sight of the Lord. And 
and so that's coming. Well, there's another dispensation is going to come, and I'm not naming those specifically for you, but, but we're going to come into another dispensation shortly at the rapture of the church. We're going to move in uh, to the tribulation period. And then after that, the millennial kingdom. But, but anyway, things were changing. So something's about to change that has never happened before. Tear ye in Jerusalem to be endued with power from on high. There's something about to happen that's never happened before. Uh, never taken place before. The difference is going to be that the Holy Spirit is going to indwell the believer. He's going to live inside of the believer. Folks, that never happened before. In the Old Testament, the Spirit of God would come down and rest on a purpose, on a, purpose, on a person for a specific purpose, and then He could depart off of Him again. But folks, as believers, that will never happen to you and to me. The Holy Spirit indwells the people. Uh, it, was a, it, it was a power that had never been available to any other people in the history of mankind in that particular way. You know, <laughs> we got all kind of religious cults today and they say all kinds, oh, you got to free up your inner self. <laughs> no, I want my inner self to be filled with the Spirit of God. That's what we need today. You know, we got programs to take the place of the power of God today. We, some of the messages, we've talked about that a little bit before. We, we talked about the Spirit of God uh, resting over the, the cherubims of the mercy seat. Then it begins to move off over the, uh, the doorpost of the, of the, of the palace and, and then out up into the mountains. And then the Spirit of God departed off of there and it was gone. And the work kept going, but the Spirit of God had departed. And I'm afraid we got a lot of that in church today we got a lot of business busyness going on but I don't know that we got a lot of the Holy Spirit behind a lot of those things today we have personalities uh, that will motivate us <laughs> some of these motivational speakers out there today boy they got a they got a strong sway um, some of them for good, some of them for bad. But what we need today is the Spirit of God. There's, there's no substitute for, about, for what God's about to do in these believers' life. Nothing can take the place of it for what God was going to do. Tarry ye in Jerusalem till ye be endued with power from on high. They were about to enter into a new era. Something had never happened before. At, uh, uh, before Pentecost, they were true disciples of Jesus. They were converted. They were uh, 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 forgiven. They had fellowship with Christ. All of these things that they had. They had the gift of preaching. You go to Luke chapter 9. They were instructed to go out and preach. Uh, they had the gift of healing. Luke chapter 9 verse 6 they had all of these things and some of those things we talked about last week that had passed away but I want to give you seven things all that's just sort of introductory to what I want to give you this morning I want to give you seven things that the, that the fullness of Christ the fullness of the Spirit brings to the believer and folks every one of us that know Jesus Christ as our Savior have access to these things this morning I'll we'll give you seven of them real quick and then we'll go home number one you'll have a knowledge of the presence of God in your life are you saved this morning don't raise your hand but I ask you a question are you saved this morning and if you say yes, I'm going to ask you another question. How do you know? How do you know that you're saved? Well, we can go to the, we can go to the Scripture. Did I, did I tell you, we, I, how, well, we don't, well, we ought to love the Bible. The Bible tells us how we can know. I talk to people, I, people some, are you saved? Well, well, I hope so. No, you can know so. 
In Romans 8 and verse 16, look at what it says. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Listen, folks, there's somebody inside of me, and I know who he is. And he bears witness with my spirit that I belong to God. You let me get out of the will of God just a little bit, and that spirit of God that lives in us, he'll say, no, 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 that's not right. You see, before I had that witness, I'd go off and do anything I want to. It didn't bother me. But once the Spirit of God lives inside of you, He bears witness with your spirit that you belong to Him. That ought to bring us into a focus of another world, folks. In Colossians 3 and verse 2, set your affection on things above and not on things of the earth. Where's your affections at today, folks? We get caught up in all these things of the world today. Our problem is that we've, we've, set, we've set our affections on things of this earth and not things of another world, of heaven. No matter what our occupation is, you and I ought to live uh, with the awareness that God lives inside of us. Tear you in Jerusalem till you be endued. We, we talked about that, the, the, the Spirit of God coming and in, indwelling believers. And folks, He lives inside of us. And if He lives there, how can we not be aware of it? Only the Spirit of God can do that. Do you have that witness today that you belong to Him? I'll give you another thing. And... Galatians 5 and verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. Those are the first three things, love, joy, and peace. But the second thing that, that I say is we ought to possess the joy of the Holy Spirit in our life. Now listen, folks, I don't mean that we're just going to go around all the time just bubbly and, and this effervescent, overflowing What's that? What's that stuff you put in your, your your false teeth and it bubbles up? And what's that stuff called? What is it? Effort in? Yeah, that's amazing. It drop that stuff. It just but. <laughs> First Peter, chapter one, verse three. The Bible says, "In whom having not seen, you love; in whom though now you see him not, yet believing." Ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, there's that, that song we sing, joy unspeakable and full of glory. Full. Hey, look, that, let it ought to be some kind of joy inside of us if the Spirit of God lives there. Uh, in whom having not seen, do you love Him today? If you love Him today, folks, you love somebody that you've never seen before. How can you love somebody that you've never seen? Well, I've never seen him, but I know where he lives. And I want to say to you folks, God has been good to this sinner. I believe I could just take off and start running now. God's been so good to me. Hallelujah! And there's a joy in that, folks, that knowing how good God is. The Bible says it's joy unspeakable and full of glory. Not be, I got to tell you, folks, I think sometimes Christians believe that you're not supposed to have any joy in your life. I mean, it's, it's like this all the time. No wonder nobody wants to be a Christian. No, look, and folks, I... I I'm grateful that God saved me. There's a joy in that. Uh, in 1 Peter 4, and we've talked about this a lot, and beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. And, and, and that's there, and that's true. Listen, when, when the fiery trial, it's not a strange thing that happens. And we've all gone through it, but, but we've got to hook verse 13 with verse 12. But rejoice 
inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Listen, folks, there ought, ought to be a joy that comes with being filled with the Spirit of God, being controlled by Him. So, the knowledge of the presence of God in our life, the, they possess, the, 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 number two, they possess the Holy Spirit. Here's another one I want to give to you. Uh, go with me to the book of Acts chapter 2 for just a minute. Acts chapter 2. Now, Pentecost has come. They, they tarried in Jerusalem. To, now they're endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, in, in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, day of Pentecost was fully come. They're all of one accord, one place. It's rushing mighty uh, wind from heaven. We talked about that. And the Spirit believed, uh, filled the believers. Look at verse 22. Now, before this point, where were they at? Well, most of the time they're they're hiding out somewhere. They're afraid. They're frightened. They were they were terrified. And and now the Holy Spirit. They've been endued with power from on high. Look at verse twenty two and. And uh, Peter gets up to preach. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man proved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered and by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken him by wicked hands, have crucified and slain. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Look down at verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, wherefore we are all witnesses. Now look down at verse 37. Now, now before you read that, look up here for just a minute. Now, before... <laughs> Before they're 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 terrified, they're afraid, they're hiding out for their life. Jesus said, "You just wait in Jerusalem till you be endued with power from on high, and then you go out and preach." And so now that's happened, and these. These men who before were afraid, to, I mean, they're afraid for their life. And now before the very ones that they were afraid of, they're standing in the midst of, and they're proclaiming Jesus Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit behind them. And look at what the results were. Verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And so here's the principle. They spoke with penetrating words. They spoke with penetrating words. I'm going to tell you what, folks. Anybody can get up and deliver a message. Listen, you can take an unsaved man and he can give up. He can stand up and deliver a message. But I'm going to tell you what, until he's endued with the power of God in his life, he don't have those penetrating words to speak. The Spirit of God took the words of the apostles and drove it home into the hearts of the people. Let's folks, people started getting saved. Thousands of people started coming to the Lord. Uh, uh, there was, their response was, men and brethren, what shall we do? The Spirit, they've been endued with power from on high. Is that the, is, is, it's just as if the Spirit of God took the words of those men and sharpened them and they just drove right into the hearts of people. I was cutting some... Um, I was cutting some beets the other day, and the knife I had, I was like I saw in these things. I'm like, man, a lot. And so I got my wet rock out, and I took, I started hitting that knife with that wet rock, and then when I finished, I went to cut them beets, whoosh, went right through it. You see the application, folks. We're dull without the Spirit of God. 
But when the Spirit of God moves in and we take the words of God and, and, and we preach them, and we give ourselves, yield ourselves to God, He takes those words just like He sharpens them and He does the work. I've said so many times and, 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 I, and I've got up and I've preached and, and I've, I've wanted to do this or I wanted to do that or I've gone out and witnessed to somebody and, and, and I didn't get the results that I thought I should get. And God says, all right, just go home and go to bed. You did what you're supposed to do. Now let me do the work. That Spirit of God, take those words. And you, know, you, you ever lay down at night and somebody say something to you and you just lay there and you can't sleep because you're thinking about what somebody's saying? Oh, listen, when the Spirit of God gets a hold of somebody's heart, yeah, go try to sleep with that taking place. They spoke when, when, they've been, when they were endued with power from the words that they spoke. See, folks, not your words. It's not my words. It's the Spirit of God now that's taking those words and driving it right into the heart of the sinner. I like this one, and there's another one. I believe we have a clear reality. Listen, folks, I'm clear about the things that are taking place in our world today. In 2 Chronicles 12, in verse 32, the Bible says, And the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Listen, folks, you and I need to preach with authority today. We need to stand up and say, Thus saith the Lord, and not be ashamed of it. That's what we need. I don't need the dialogue between unbelievers and theologians about what the Bible says. I don't need the, the dialogue about the sanctity of what marriage is today. No, that's big today, folks. You mark it down, people are going to be marrying their cats before long. You, oh, preacher, that never happened. Well, you wait and see. We don't need to dialogue about that. The Bible's clear. One man for one woman for one lifetime. I don't need to, I don't need to dialogue about gender equality today. I don't need to wonder if it's right to take a bunch of drag queens and put them in our elementary schools today and let them read ungodly who knows what to our seven, eight-year-olds. I'm clear about that today. And I know what we ought to do. We need an understanding of the times and not be afraid to tell the truth. You see, we, we got to back off today because, you know, we might offend somebody. You know, the government's going to hear what you say. They're going to come in. If you talk like that, they'll shut you down today. Uh, all of the... Mm, we need an understanding of the times, folks. Not be afraid to tell the truth. Now, but I've told you so many times, my problem's not knowing right from wrong. What's my biggest problem? Doing right. I know right from wrong. No, there's somebody that lives inside of me that, that, that shows me right from wrong. And my problem's not doing, uh, not knowing right from wrong, it's doing what's right. Men and women, what shall we do in this day? Well, the men of Issachar, children of Issachar, they were men that had understanding of the times to know what to do. What do we do? Well, we repent. We get right with God. We get back to living the way this book says that we ought to live. And if we'll yield to the Spirit of God, He'll show us how we should live our life. There'd be no question. They had a clear sense of what reality is today. Listen, folks, the world can change, and the world does change. And the world can tell you, well, this has changed, and that old antiquated Bible, that book of old stories that old white men, Jews, Jews, and this and that and the other wrote down, they don't matter anymore. Yes, they do. We need an understanding of the times. We need to get back to this book today. And if we'll follow the Spirit of God, He'll lead us to this. A couple more things I'll give you. And, 
and nothing new, but when the Spirit of God came and indwelt the believers and He dwells you in a... Listen, He's going to give us a sense of separating from the world. And you say, well, we knew that was coming. But how do you get away from it, folks? We're talking about being endued with power from on high. Remember we talked about it last week? We talked about all, remember? We talked about all the, the deserts around the world, all the rivers and the oceans and the mountain ranges, and He holds them in the span of His hand from the tip of His thumb to the tip of His finger. He holds them all right there, and He lives inside of us. How can we not be different? Know you not, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. See, don't get up on your high horse because the Bible says such were some of you. Some of you fall into this list right here. <laughs> but you are washed. But you are sanctified. But you are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus, look at it, and by the Spirit of our God. Where does He live? How can we not be different? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, Be not only equally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Or an unbeliever. Spent what that means. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. I'll be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. What did he say? Where, did, where does he live? You are the temple of the living God. Wow. Brought about a separation from the world. I'll give you one more. Well, I've got two more, but I'll go quick. Here's the next thing. They took great delight in prayer and communion. Now, I struggle with, with this one right here a little bit. And... I'll tell you why. You remember when Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane? Took His disciples there. He took a few more with Him. Y'all remember who they were? Peter, James, and John. He went a little bit further. He said, now y'all stay here. I'm going to go yonder and pray. And He went yonder and He began to pray. What did the disciples do? They fell asleep. He came back, woke him up. Hey, can't you watch with me? Watch and pray that you are not into temptation. Went away, fell asleep again. And I, I, I said I sort of struggle with this a little bit because I'm up here pouring my heart out sometimes. I look out in the congregation and I say... <laughs> <laughs> but the difference is, listen, no. The difference is after Pentecost and you follow the, the disciples after that they're not they're not sleeping and uh, they're praying they're communing with one another and they're praying Acts chapter 1 and verse 14 these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and with his brethren you see before they didn't get it Jesus was on His way to the cross and they're sleeping. But now they've been endued with power on high and now they get it. In Acts chapter 6 and verse 4, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. In Acts chapter 12 verse 5, Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. 
Now they had a problem. God answered the prayer. And they, they couldn't even believe God had answered the prayer. But they still was praying. In Romans 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans 12 and 12. Rejoice in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Listen folks, if anything's going to be done in the church today, it needs to be done by prayer. Jack, you got up this morning and announced the pulpit committee. I want to challenge the pulpit committee. You get together and pray over this decision that you're about to make. One more. And I just mentioned it. I've already talked about it a little bit. They had a new love for the Scriptures. They had a new love for the Scriptures. In the Gospel, Jesus is always quoting the Scriptures. By the way, does anybody know which book Jesus quoted more often than any other? Some of y'all said Isaiah? Is that, is that the consensus of everybody? What's that? Psalms. Psalms? Is that anybody? No, no, not even close. Deuteronomy. Thus it is written, thus it is written, thus it is written. He was always quoting the scriptures. That's just a sort of sidebar there. But. but then we come to the book of Acts and we find we find the apostles quoting the scriptures. Listen, a lot of times folks, they got up to preach, they just quote Old Testament verses. They were quoting the Psalms. They were quoting Isaiah. And, and they just fell in love with the Bible. Now there's, there's hundreds of verses that we could go to and look at right now.